eloquently describe uh, two views of the world, the Schelling view uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, characterize the, the, the first view, which is that uh, potentially you should grow your way out of poverty and that should uh, uh, also address the issue of uh, climate change. But I, I, you know, I gather from your model that you, the key assumption there is that as you grow, you build that uh, adaptative uh, capital. So, uh, of course, if you assume that there's, uh, you know, by growing or not, you know, th there's no assumption here that, uh, you know, growing, you know, in a way leads to uh, a build-up of adapt adaptive capital, you uh, get the conclusion that, of course, you need to do something about adaptation and build that stock separately from uh, the way you grow. Because I, I believe uh, uh, Schelling's view is that there are elements in development that induce the build-up of an adaptive capital. In, I guess that, right. that's probably the view. So I guess it's, you know, if you make that assumption, the model is very different, and then you... Well, so I, think it, I think the issue here is to be very clear about what we mean by adaptive capital, right? So in the model, it's, it's a very, very stark uh, comparison. And I, I sort of said it during the presentation, is that adaptive capital is something that gives you no development benefit whatsoever, okay? It's only something that's beneficial if the climate changes. So, yes, it's certainly true that if you build a dam, it has a developmental benefit, right? But it's only, say, the extra foot of the dam that protect, protects against sort of water availability variability that you build specifically to counter the change in climate in the future that we count as ad adaptive, uh, adaptive capital, right? But the, so, the other type of capital doesn't have any adaptive. So th no, that's a very strong assumption. It, it's, well. it's, not, it's not a strong assumption. It's, it's a necessary assumption if, in order to talk sensibly about what you mean, right? Because if you're talking about, if you're saying the vulnerable capital has adaptive capacity, then what you're saying is that really it's adaptation, right? Then you're saying that the, the, that foot of the, ta of the dam is in fact adaptive capital. So it's a sort of difficult thing to get your head around because um, the capital is not actually different pieces of capital. Each piece of capital has both potentially both, both adaptive and vulnerable components. And we're talking about you know, how much of each of those things do we need. So it's not, I don't think it's correct to say that the vulnerable capital um, sort of has no uh, adaptive, I mean, the, the, the key point is that when you make that distinction cleanly and you allow the model to choose those variables itself optimally, then the results are, make a lot of sense, right? Then it's really, you, you're sort of getting at exactly the kind of trade-off that you, that you want to put into the model, yeah. Maybe. Let me, I turn to Finn, uh, maybe first. Thank you very much, uh, Finn Tabweide. I, I mean, I, I get your point. I mean, just for example, thinking about roads, right? I mean, you can climate-proof roads. Mm. That, that would then, as I understand it, that would then be the adaptive capital that you're adding right. to the vulnerable right. capital, and, 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 and then you're kind of trying. But, I mean, to which extent uh, are you sort of including this thing that, okay, as you move forward, then you might adapt by not putting the road the same place? Right, right. Uh, how, how does that sort of come into your thinking about it? Um, so that is, it, it's, it's a sort of level of detail that the model doesn't resolve, right? Um, it's a very high level macroeconomic model, um, which really can't speak to sort of locational issues at all. Um, nevertheless, I would say that, um, you know, that if you are trading off the position of a road, so imagine that in today's climate, the road would be optimally built in position X. And when you consider that the climate in the future may change, you build the road in position Y, and that incurs some additional cost, right? Well, that's a cost that means must be sustained through adaptive capital. And in fact, the position of the road is, in some sense, an adaptive capital, right? So that's really the level of, of um, at which the model can answer that question. It's perhaps you know, very unsatisfying from the perspective of that particular example. But at the macro level, you need to sort of make this very clean distinction between the two types of capital, yeah. Yes. 
Um, following up on this question of adaptive capital, I understood your definition to be the kind of investment which uh, ascertains a protection in the future should mm -hmm. the climate change. Right, exactly. Okay. Now, applying that idea to the question of afforestation, we have vast areas of land which are degraded or need afforestation because they're totally destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the question that arises here is whether we shall have forest with monocultures for certain benefits like fuel wood and so on, or should we have forest and try and get back part of the original uh, natural forests? Mm -hmm. Now, when you come to climate change, the danger of this kind of adaptive investment is that uh, there is a fear among many that when climate changes, the natural forests might uh, be partly destroyed. The composition of the plants would change, mm -hmm. uh, usually degraded mm -hmm. in terms of biodiversity. Mm -hmm. If you put a monoculture, the trees used for monoculture afforestation have got a good past track record. Mm -hmm. And probably we can predict their track record in a future climatic change situation. But it's rather expensive in a way to, uh, to invest this so-called long-term adaptive capital when you don't really know what will be the result. Right. And your whole investment might be totally destroyed because those particular plants or trees also cannot stand up to the change because they haven't had time to evolve right. uh, a change in their capability to sustain in the new climatic conditions. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want your comments on that. Well, I mean, I would say that it seems that the sort of core issues that you're raising there are issues to do with uncertainty, right? So really about how do you, and, and I would say that really this model is just not, not appropriate for d thinking about very sort of small scale uh, impact specific issues like that. But um, there is of course a, a, a large literature that looks at sort of optimal investment when you, you really don't know what's gonna happen and moreover you're gonna learn in the future what's going to happen. So there are sort of real options techniques, there are sort of quasi option value techniques that allow you to sort of build into your investment strategy the, the value of the new information that you're going to get in the future as, as the climate changes and it's revealed to you how bad it's going to be. Um, and I would say that for the kind of problem you're describing, those methods are probably much more appropriate. Um, now it's, it's true that as I said at the end, building uncertainty and irreversibilities and things like that into this kind of model would be desirable and would likely change some of the conclusions. Which way they would go, I really don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a sort of frontier of, of current research. Um, yeah, but I mean, I guess the short answer is that, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a mismatch of tools in this case. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we have time for one more question. Young Fu. Uh, I'm Yong Huang from UNU Wider. Thank you very much, Tony and Tony. And I think your work um, is of great quality. And I have two questions. Um, I can see you basically modified the Ramsey model by introducing the adaptive capital in the temperature to the model. Um, so my first question is, could you roughly describe the balanced growth path of your model? as well as the equilibrium um, in uh, adaptive investment, adaptive capital, it is steady state. Okay, now second question, sorry, <coughs> second question. I can see the, the concept um, adaptive investment is very interesting, which could be regarded as the climate finance for adaptation. But in, in your paper, you basically start saying the change in adaptive capital is the, <coughs> the difference <coughs> difference between the adaptive investment and uh, depreciation. And the, the change right, in the normal capital should be the difference between the normal investment and the depreciation as well. Okay. However, the normal investment has disappeared. <laughs> Could you describe the difference between these two? Okay, thank you. Okay, let me start with the last question. So the normal investment hasn't disappeared, we've just rewritten it using an accounting identity. So there's an identity between uh, investment, consumption, and output, and that's an identity that holds throughout time. And I've just written the equation in terms of the consumption control variable instead of the investment control variable. So you could write exactly the same model using an investment variable, and you'd get two equations that look identical. 
but then you need to enforce the accounting identity at every point in time. And it's just computationally and actually analytically easier to use the consumption control variable instead of the investment control variable. It's identical. So um, let me show you um, just quickly. Yeah, so, Tony, we, we have to wrap up. So okay. if you can make so on, on the, all right. So all right. So the point is that basically you get two equations that look exactly like that. One investment in uh, a vulnerable, one investment in adaptive. But there's a, an identity that contains all the other terms. That, and, and it's an exactly equivalent formulation. The issue of steady states, you know, this is something that macroeconomists do a lot of. Um, they sort of write down a model like this and they forecast right into the infinite future and look at what happens in the steady state of the economy. Um, the issue with the climate problem is that it's completely irrelevant what happens in the inf infinite future. What you care about is the transition between today and the future, all right? So the infinite future is heavily discounted in the model. You really don't care about what happens. And moreover, it's the dynamic aspects of the problem. It's the fact that the, the, that the economy is adjusting dynamically to the change in temperature that's really interesting in this problem. So yes, you could linearize around, around the steady states and calculate it and look at the stability, but it's really immaterial to the actual pro policy question that you want to ask, which is what is the optimal dynamic trajectory of investment today and for the next 100 years? That's not a steady state question. All right. Thank you very much. I'm afraid this is uh, all, we, all the time we have for a uh, question. So I want to use that opportunity to thank the presenter and uh, to thank the audience for a very rich discussion. Thank you very much.